about the recent pandemic disease which was caused by COVID-19 virus. For the past two years, many leaves has been lost due to this disease. Finally, after vaccine's introduction and vaccination, it started to reduce and the world is coming back in gas. Recombinant DNA technology is the process that uses enzymes and various laboratory techniques to manipulate DNA segments of interest. Then, what are the key tools that accomplish genetic engineering or recombinant DNA technology? They are restriction enzymes, polymerase enzymes, ligases, vectors and host organisms. Do you have any idea about the restriction enzymes? A restriction enzyme is a protein isolated from bacteria that cleaves DNA sequences at sequence specific sites and produces DNA fragments. In the year 1963, the two enzymes which restricted the growth of bacteriophage was isolated from Estrichia coli. One of these restriction enzymes added methyl group to DNA and the other enzyme cut the DNA. The latter one was known as restriction endonuclease. The first restriction endonuclease was HIN2. The functions of these endonuclease is dependent on specific DNA nucleotide sequence and it was characterized five years later. Do you have any idea how these restriction enzymes works? HIN2 always cut DNA molecule at a particular point by recognizing a specific sequence of six base pair which is known as recognition sequence. Other than HIN2, there are 900 restriction enzymes that are isolated from 230 bacterial strains each recognizing different recognition sequences. Let's now see the naming of restriction enzyme. Generally, the first letter of these enzymes come from the genus and the second two letters come from the species of the bacterial cell from which they are isolated. For example, Eco R1 comes from Estrichia coli RY13. The letter R is derived from the name of the strain and the Roman number indicates the order in which the enzyme were isolated from that strain of bacteria. Restriction enzymes belong to a large class of enzymes called nucleases which is of two types namely one is exonucleases which removes nucleotides from the end of the DNA strand and the other is endonucleases which may cut at specific position within the DNA. Then what are the steps involved in the formation of recombinant DNA? Once each restriction endonuclease finds its specific recognition sequences by inspecting the length of the DNA sequence, it binds to the DNA and cut each of the two double helix strands at a specific point in their sugar phosphate backbones. Each of these restriction endonucleases recognizes specific palindromic nucleotide sequences in the DNA. Do you know what palindromes are? Palindromes are groups of letters that form the same word that read both forward and backward. For example, look at the letter Malayalam. It is read same from forward as well as backward. Similar goes with the word noon, level, madam, etc. 
the palindrome in DNA is a sequence of base pairs that reads the same on the two strands when the orientation of the reading is kept the same. For example, the 5 prime GAA TTC and the 3 prime CTT AAG, these sequence read the same on the both strand from both the direction. Now, Restriction enzyme cuts the strand of DNA a little away from the center of the palindrome sites, but it cuts between the same two bases on the opposite strands and this leaves single-stranded portions at the ends. These single-stranded overhanging stretches are called sticky ends. Why were they named sticky ends? because they form hydrogen bond with their complementary cut counterparts. This stickiness helps DNA ligase to act. In genetic engineering, restriction endonuclease are used to form recombinant DNA molecule. When cut by the same restriction enzyme, the resultant DNA fragments have the same kind of sticky ends. And these can be joined together by using the enzyme DNA ligase. Here we can conclude that the recombinant vector molecule cannot be created unless one cuts the vector and the source DNA with the same restriction enzyme. We'll now move on to the separation and isolation of DNA fragments. Separation is done using gel electrophoresis. DNA fragments are negatively charged molecule that can be separated by forcing them to move towards the anode under an electric field through a medium. The most commonly used medium is agarose, a natural polymer extracted from seaweeds. The DNA fragments are separated based on their size. If the fragment size is small, it moves farther. Once separated, the DNA is stained using a compound known as ethidium bromide and visualized under the exposure of UV radiations. We can see bright orange color bands of DNA in ethidium bromide strain gel. The separated bands of DNA are cut out from the agarose gel and extracted from the gel piece. The step is known as elution. The DNA fragments which are purified in this way are stored in constricting recombinant DNA by joining them with cloning vectors. Now what are cloning vectors? We already know that plasmids and bacteriophage can replicate within bacterial cell independent of the controlled chromosomal DNA. Some plasmids may have only one or two copies per cell while some other have 15 to 100 copies per cell and the numbers may even go higher. If we can link an alien piece of DNA with bacteriophage or plasmid DNA, we can multiply its numbers which is equal to the copy number of the plasmid or bacteriophage. Vectors used at present can help easily link foreign DNA and selection of recombinants from non-recombinants. Do you have any idea what features are required to facilitate the cloning into the vector? There are four features. Origin of replication, presence of selectable marker, a cloning site, and a vector to transfer genes into the host. Let's start with the origin of replication. Origin of a replication is also known as ORI. The name itself shows that this is a sequence from where replication start and any piece of DNA when linked to this sequence can be made to replicate within the host cells. It is also responsible for controlling the copy number of the linked DNA. 
Therefore, if you want more copy number, you must choose a vector that supports more copy number. The second one is the selectable marker. It helps in identifying and eliminating non-transformants and selectively permitting the growth of transformants. You have already heard the word transformation while studying Griffith's experiment. Transformation is a procedure through which a piece of DNA is introduced into a host bacterium. The genes encoding resistant to antibiotics such as ampicillin, chloramphenicol, tetracycline, canamycin, etc. are considered useful selectable markers for E. coli as the normal E. coli cell do not carry resistance against any of these antibiotics. The third one is cloning sites. To link the desired DNA, the vector need to have a single recognition site for commonly used restriction enzymes. As you can see in the image, there is only one site for eco R1. The presence of more than one recognition site within the vector will generate several fragments which will complicate gene cloning. The ligation of desired DNA is carried out at a restriction site which is present in one of the two antibiotic resistance genes. For example, we can ligate a foreign DNA at the BAM H1 site of the tetracycline resistant gene in the vector PBR322. Due to the insertion of the foreign DNA, the recombinant plasmid will lose tetracycline resistant but they can still be selected out from non-recombinant ones by plating the recombinants on a tetracycline containing medium. The transformants which are growing on an ampicillin containing medium are then transferred to a medium containing tetracycline where they won't grow. But the non-recombinant will grow on the medium containing both the antibiotics. In this case, the inactivated gene marker due to the insertion of alien DNA helps in the selection of recombinant. The selection of recombinant is due to the inactivation of antibiotics is a cumbersome procedure. It is called so because it requires simultaneous plating on two plates having different antibiotics. So, alternative selectable markers have been developed that can differentiate recombinants from non-recombinants based on their availability to produce the color in the presence of a chromogenic substrates. Let's see how. Desired DNA is inserted within the coding sequence of an enzyme called beta-galactosidase. This leads to the inactivation of the gene for the synthesis of this enzyme which is referred to as insertional inactivation. If the plasmid in the bacteria does not have an insert, the presence of a chromogenic substance gives blue colored colonies as shown in the image. The presence of insert results in insertional inactivation of the beta-galactosidase gene and the colonies do not produce any color. These are identified as recombinant colonies. The fourth one is the vector, which are used for cloning genes in plants and animals. Have you heard of agrobacterium tumefaciens? A bacterial pathogen that infects several dicot plants and can deliver piece of DNA which is commonly known as tDNA to transform normal plant cells into a tumor and direct these tumor cells to produce the chemicals required by the pathogen. Likewise, retrovirus in animals also transform normal cells into cancerous cells. The tumor inducing TI plasmids of agrobacterium tumefaciens has now been modified into a cloning vector that is no more pathogenic to the plants. But 
still it can use the mechanism to deliver genes of our interest into a variety of plants. Similarly, retrovirus have also been disarmed and now used to deliver desirable gene into animal cells. So, once a gene or a DNA fragment has been ligated into a suitable vector, it is transferred into a bacterial plant or animal host. The last tool of recombinant DNA technology is the competent host. Do you know what type of molecule the DNA is? It is a hydrophilic molecule and it cannot pass through cell membrane. The bacterial cells must first be made competent to take up the DNA. This is done by treating them with a specific concentration of a divalent cation such as calcium. This increases the efficiency with which DNA enters the bacterium through pores in its cell wall. Then the recombinant DNA is forced into such cell by incubating the cell with recombinant DNA on ice followed by heat shocks at 42 degrees Celsius and then putting them back on ice. This enables the bacterium to take up the recombinant DNA as shown here. There is also another method for transfer of desired DNA. Let's first see the method called microinjection, which is used to introduce alien DNA into host cell. In this, recombinant DNA is directly injected into the nucleus of an animal cell. Another method is biolistic or gene gun method. In this, cells are bombarded with high velocity microparticles of gold or tungsten coated with DNA. This method is suitable for plants. This was about the tools required for constructing recombinant DNA. Then what will be the process facilitating recombinant DNA technology? Let's check that in our next session. Let's now summarize what we have learned. Manorama Horizon. Learning made simple.